Chairman, Mr. Um, uh, again, we're going to be looking at uh, mechanics inspired by uh, the Lordism and the Tombs and Sand. Uh, just to give you a sense of where we were and where we're going, we sort of talk about some physics and some biological experiments in the last two lectures, as well as some modeling approach, a robot modeling approach, which for us, again, functions as a physical model of the organism, or which we can test hypotheses about what the organism actually is doing, uh, and why it might be doing what it's doing. And today we're going to kind of come back, that was a big device, today we're going to come back to the scale of the organism and try to do some modeling to explain the organism scale, what it's doing. Uh, so I'll show you our uh, computer simulation approach to this. We'll test some of the model predictions. There's a model without uh, testing the predictions. And then we will get into the last, I will get into the last bit of some of our work to try to create a resistive force type theory for a model of the same sort of something which you could have some utility calculating things more rapidly with our simulations. So just to remind you, this is, this, most of this work actually uh, this paper just came out, I think, today. This, this one in the Royal Side Interface, and they put Sandfish on the cover, which I was happy to see. Okay, here it is the Sandfish Lizard. It's a skink, lives in the deserts of Africa. It does this, and it swims underneath the sand. We use high speed x ray imaging to reveal that it can swim at several body weights a second within the brand new material. It's actually diving in at about 20 degrees into. Material, those little markers on its back are just little lead chips, which weigh almost nothing, but allow us to track uh, points along its back using some computer software, as well as to reveal that it doesn't use its limbs. So it's a nice problem in the sense that this animal is executing its undulatory motion, and we think that's the dominant uh, factor of, of the propulsion. And it may remind you of this we'll sea elegant or in water. We'll come back to that. And again, we were able to, by doing these experiments over and over and over with many animals, to find that when the animal is actually diving straight into the material, uh, not turning and not stopping and starting, but executing this swimming behavior, it does something which is kind of simple. It propagates a wave anterior to posterior, head to tail, uh, down its body, and that wave can be pretty well described by a single period of sinusoidal amplitude A, wavelength lambda, with a wave speed VW, and an average forward swimming speed Vx. By this equation, and uh, yeah, so that's sort of the basics. We can then ask how parameters like a and lambda depend on various things like the compaction of the ground, and we found that in fact they didn't hardly at all. And what was interesting is that the animal maintains basically an a over lambda, which you kind of characterize this sinusoidal shape. The kinematics about 0.2, regardless of preparation of the material and regardless of particle size. So it's sort of a robust way to swim. We had a hypothesis that, in fact, that animal is actually targeting that for reasons which may be good. Um, the kind of important thing to remember is that the speed of the animal increases with the uh, undulation frequency, which the animal picks. We do not set the undulation frequency. And we can define a kind of kinematic efficiency, or we call it, we call it the wave efficiency, which is the ratio of the forward speed to the wave speed. And it happens to be about 0.5 in the sandfish. Uh, and that's, again, independent of uh, the material preparation. Uh, just some intuition to remind you, zero would be the animal just beating itself in the vacuum, not going anywhere, and one would be if the animal is swimming in, for example, cork, swimming in basically a tube of its own devising. Uh, and we were able to make a physical model of this animal, which in fact is uh, obviously not an organism, it's much, much simpler, but has um, six servo motors, which we can control their positions to mimic the kind of kinematics we observe in the organism, and we're able to make it swim surface as well. And it turns out that performance comparably organism. And so we found that out in our computer simulation. And so that's what we learned yesterday and the day before. And now let's go to uh, a sandfish scale simulation. So here's our animal. And if you'll recall, I said that we could make this animal, uh, not make, we, if, <laughs> if, if presented with these sort of ridiculous non uh, non-desert sand particles, glass beads of three millimeter in size, the animal had no problem at all swimming into this material and in fact executed uh, its A over lambda of 0.2 undulation uh, and achieved comparable wave efficiency, which is a wonderful thing for us. Had it not been the case, we would have been, I think, a little bit in trouble uh, because we could then fill a container of uh, beads in the computer simulation um, and uh, create a sandfish uh, <coughs> numerical model 
and have a container of grain material in computer which contain hundreds of thousands and not billions or trillions of grains, which for us computation would be impossible. Uh, and so this is what we did. It's the same technique I described yesterday. Essentially, we have our discrete element model, uh, which we validate this experiment. So we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And we cook up a 50-segment sandfish model. These segments are uh, uh, can be controlled such that the angle between them, uh, beta here, so beta now, uh, is given by this, which basically replicates a traveling sinusoid of using amplitude. We can control a lambda and frequency. Those are the parameters we can put into the model. And we put it into a box in silico in the computer. And the box is about this size. And here you see the rendered sandfish. You can't see the particles here. And these are about 10 to the fifth, 3 millimeter glass particles. And I put glass in quotes because I'll explain in a second. Uh, I think that's all I want to say. Ah, yes. The other thing we can do is this is that we can, in simulation, make this shape uh, basically of any, any kind we want. And we chose here, uh, the first part of the experiment that I'll talk about, similar I'll talk about, to make it have a kind of taper uh, shape which resembles that of the actual thing. You know, it sort of narrows as it goes to the snout, towards the tail, and it's thicker in the middle. And again, this is basically a 2D uh, simulation embedded in a 3D granular medium. And so there's no tapering in this dimension. We can also make a kind of non sandfish like uh, square blunt-headed organism, and that will be important later when we talk about some theoretical models. So that's what we could do. Uh, again, just to remind you that the most important part of this business is that the simulation is not just, you know, the expression simulations are doomed to succeed, right? That you can get whatever you want. Uh, this is a simulation which has, does a good job of matching what we observe in the real world. Uh, so here, for example, we take a rod, a little stainless steel cylinder, and we tow it, we drag it using a stiff rod through the granular material at a speed, v. It turns out that the speed is independent, the force that we measure independent of the speed at which we tow it. And we, for example, in this experiment can vary this angle of the rod with respect to the heading direction, the axis of the rod with respect to the heading direction. And we find that the force in the experiment is green. The force starts small when the rod is basically head on like this. The drag is being dominated by the drag of grains against the sidewalls. And when the rod is towed in this direction, the rod is now plowing material, and the drag is larger because the cross-sectional area is larger. Uh, and so this curve increases this way. And we set the parameters in our contact model, collisional contact model, once, and then basically forget them. And then we can change the orientation plot the experiment and simulation, and we get a good match over this range. So is that's factor of two? Hmm? Is it a factor of two? It is a factor of two. And yeah, keep that in mind because that will come back to that at the end of the. There's a reason we're doing this, and if you know, most of you, of course, know resistive force type arguments. And the reason we did this is so we could get the resistive force parameters, but that's the end of the talk. But, so it's not just a crazy thing that we did. Yeah? Was there a question? Okay. So um, just to keep in mind, again, these parameters, this is sort of the dirty secret of, not such a secret, uh, maybe not even so dirty of. The DEM simulations, that these two parameters are typically a factor of 100 to 1,000 off from the real world uh, values of those parameters, but it doesn't seem to make much of a difference in anything that we've measured so far. Okay, uh, we need a friction parameter. This is the friction between the grains, but there's also friction between the grains when they collide with the body. We assume that the collision with the body is basically the same kind of hardness as the collision with the, with the particle. Particle collision um, seems to be okay. But the friction is clearly different. The friction between the particles is about 0.1. The friction between the animal, the way we found it, is a, a technique which you basically glue a monolayer of particles to a board. You anesthetize the animal, you put it to sleep. You tilt the board until uh, the animal falls down. I think Mike and David Hu did some of this with their snakes. In fact, I think that's probably where we got the idea. You get the friction coefficients. They were looking at anisotropic friction coefficients. But it turns out that we don't think that the anisotropy and the scales on the sandfish uh, play much of a role, which I'll show you. We get that, and we can find it out for point three. So the friction between the animal is not. not uh, people have expected that people in the literature report very low values of friction to these animals. It's not really OK. And here's what it is. This is you turn on the computer, you let it go, you let it just track the collision of the particles. I should also say, because there was a question afterwards yesterday, that this is a soft sphere molecular dynamics simulation, basically. And so 
The particles, when they collide, have the chance to overlap a little bit, delta. And the collisional force, the restoring force, is proportional to that delta 33 as power. So we're basically following those collisions and integrating through those collisions, as well as integrating the force of gravity, which is pointing to the board here. The particles above the uh, simulation box here have been rendered transparent so you can see what's going on. And if you'll remember the kind of non-overlapping tracks, plots that I showed for the animal yesterday, these look very similar. Yes? How compressible is this uh, system compared to the real system? Meaning what sense? The particles or the actual? Just, just the agglomerate. Yeah, yeah, so I should have said that. So it turns out that we can, we can create the same uh, states of compaction in the simulation and the experiment. We can go from about 58% volume fraction to about 62% uh, in, in, the, in the simulation. So we can, in fact, these were done, I think, in these, this one is, I think, is a loosely packed state, uh, but identical. And in fact, the, the validation works whether you, the nice thing about this is just once you tune the parameters, the validation works whether you use a compact state or a loose state or anything. So, so about 10%, but that 10% has a, a factor of one and a half or two in resistance forces. Okay, so it looks pretty good. And again, you can see this kind of nice region of mobility, mobile particles surrounding the organism, or the model here, and everywhere else it looks basically like a solid. So this animal sort of locally fluidizing the material and then propelling itself through that local fluid. Uh, just to show you that it kind of captures reality, uh, here is some tracks, uh, track points uh, on the head and sort of middle of the body in the near the tail of the animal uh, as a function of position. X and Y is what you see uh, staring down in the video and experiment, and this is what you see in simulation. Okay. Nice thing is you can then, of course, ask the simulation to tell you what the speed of the uh, simulated sandfish is, a function of undulation frequency, which you do control now in the simulation. And here is the data for the animal, this sort of scattered uh, noisy looking data. Red points are closely packed in blue points are loosely packed, and you can see that these lines basically go straight through the data. And this again is, we're not fitting anything in the animal experiments, we simply validate the granular materials using a set of just physics experiments, we measure a friction coefficient, we put it all in, we put the kinematics in this traveling wave we measure, and out pops that, and you can of course, of course compute the slope, that's the wave efficiency, and it's almost too good in that way, yeah, right on, which was very surprising to me when we started. So I'd say that's our big result. So I'd say we could go home now, but now we're going to start to use it. Uh, uh, because you can then do things in the simulation where you can vary, for example, the amplitude of the wave. Uh, so here you can make the sandfish uh, swim in a very kind of funny looking up and down sort of movement here with a low amplitude. And you can measure the speed of the organism, like we did in the robot yesterday, in terms of body length that advances per cycle, per undulation cycle. And you see that there is a maximum, and this is where the animal sits. And whether it sits there because it wants to go fast or not, that's just a sort of get hypothesis, but uh, we think that's pretty compelling if the animal knows how to get into the material as fast as it can. Yeah? I'm sorry if you mentioned this uh, yeah. earlier, but uh, was there a particular intuitive way of expecting a bigger difference in data between the loose path case and the close path case? Is there yeah. a reason why? I'll get to that. I'll get to our speculations about that at the end. We don't. I wouldn't say we have the, the final answer on why there's a difference, but uh, I'll get to that at the very end of the talk. Uh, I think it's an. I think it's a potentially very interesting story. Uh, uh, but yeah, we can go on. Get to that. Uh, okay. And here's where. And so that's our. Hypothesis. And then you can go in. This is just I think a nice movie to kind of illustrate the point about the localized fluid that I made earlier. Here we've color coded the particles such that redder particles are moving faster in speed. And you can see that only in this little region is there any granular temperature associated with particles. Everywhere else, the blue means the thing is just ice cold in the granular temperature sense. The head is moving a good amount of particles, and the body sort of moves particles that you know, it's a complicated sort of flow field in time. You can get some idea of the extent of this the fluid region by measuring as you go away from the body, for example, at any instant of time, the, the mean speed of particles uh, moving away from the body. You can see it sort of decays, and here's the body. So, yeah? Similar to what Phoebe does, does the size of that change with loose pack and loose pack? We haven't done a whole lot of that, but I'll get to that also at the end. That's one of the that's one of the open questions as to what's going on in the material uh, when the, the producer closes back.
that we have to look carefully into that. So yeah. related to that, your your movies when you drive the flat plate, yeah. the sound were really striking when you increased the, the packing. Yeah. You saw that those bows in the front. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so is this proof that a, that a lizard's not a flat plate? I think that there's two things going on here, and one is kind of, uh, and this is also something that we're looking at. It turns out that these particles are less frictional than the particles we used in those plate drag experiments. And in these less frictional materials, they tend to, uh, a loosely packed state tends to be very close to a closely packed state in volume fraction, in terms of uses for closer. Uh, we don't see in the low friction uh, simulations of these you know, beautiful, um, uh, well-defined slip planes. And we think that's uh, a result of the fact that they're lower in friction. Uh, but we also think that it could, the particle size could play a role as well. But numerically, that. these are tests that you could easily do even if you can't convince your lizard to go through some other stuff. Yeah, that's right. And we're doing that. We're doing that right now. Yeah. Uh, we're starting to vary all these parameters. But that's exactly it. And my speculation is honestly that, that if you'll recall, uh, when I plotted, actually, I don't have to draw it. If you recall, well, you see, the, these particles, these three millimeter particles, are are less frictional than the than the 300 micron, basically, sand that we tested the sand fishing in the experiment the other day. And if you remember, change the day. If you remember, I plotted dx over lambda versus frequency for the sand fish, and essentially kind of follow this line, and you had a cloud of particles for loosely packed, and you also had a cloud of particles for closely packed, but that cloud extended, that cloud extended further in frequency range. And my speculation is, in these materials which you can develop these uh, strong shear planes, that somehow the animal can time its push to push off this sort of Location points, but we, that's just pure speculation at this point. And since we don't see that in here, maybe it's not such a big surprise that the difference between loose and close is not so huge. But yeah, but that's one of the things we're interested in to test. There's another way we can get at that, and that's by in fact applying loads, by applying pressure to the top of the plate to not allow it to dilate as easily. We should be able to reduce these things. So yeah, we don't know yet at this point. So I don't want to make a whole lot of comparison yet on the loose and close pack in these, in these particles. But the bottom line is that in the states that we can create the experiment, the states that we can create the simulation, we, uh, what we measure in the animal is what we measure in the simulation, at least for this average one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Then, do, do you see some sort of systematic relation between stress and rate of strain? And do you think of it as being kind of fluidic around the... So, yeah, so around, and then I'll come back to this, the, the, I think that this idea of a frictional fluid is, is really the kind of thing we have in the back of our head, so there's no strain rate dependence in any of the forces, any of the stresses. Uh, so whether the, and I'll come back if we have some good evidence for that. But that seems to be kind of one of the most kind of basic features of these things, that these kind of strain rates and these, these velocities, forces are largely independent. So the cool thing, of course, is the simulation, which we can't yet do in the experiment, uh, because we can't outfit the organism with little strain and force sensors all over its body yet. Uh, we, we'd like to. Uh, we can then go in and ask locally. Uh, again, you're looking down now at the, uh, the simulation here. We can ask locally what the force is on the, on the organism, what the resistive force is. So, here, an example, this will play through a few times. You can see that the head, uh, in the black here, is the, is the magnitude force, the magnitude force, the magnitude force, and this is the scale about half a newton. So you can see the head is sort of plowing through and generating, for a small thing this big, generating about a newton of force to break up the material in front of it. And then you can see that the body segments, uh, and I say loosely, there are no segments, it's one continuous thing, basically. But the elements on the body, uh, are essentially experiencing force, which changes in an interesting way as a function of time, but is such that resistive forces are being generated to propel the organism forward. So here, if you watch it, you can see that they're up into the right here, and now they're to the left. And you see the bulk of the forces away propagating the bulk is the 
You can then go in and ask as well about the activation of the motors. What's generating the forces that uh, makes this organism move through the material? And here's a plot, a relatively recent plot, in which Young has, my student Young has basically measured this thing, remember, is made up of 50 basically motor elements, which we're controlling the kinematics of. And you can measure the torque that it takes to move those segments within the granular material. And, and he finds that uh, basically, so here we have three points. The green is towards the head, the red is in the middle, and the black is towards the tail. Uh, the dark is towards the tail. And if you go left to right here, you can see that the green uh, torque increases. And it decreases and increases and decreases as the motors move the segments back and forth. Uh, and you can see that it's a little bit larger in the red in, in peak to peak amplitude, and then the black is smaller. And you can plot, for example, the RMS that torque, and you see that along the body, that the motors in the middle of the back, like you might expect, have to generate the largest torques because they're the things that actually have to move the largest torque motors. So there you go. Uh, to get to Mike's question, you can then ask questions about how the torque changes as you change the frequency of the uh, undulator. And you can see that here, basically, it's flat, independent, meaning that the friction is dominating this, and meaning as well that the uh, inertial <coughs> loads are small, meaning that basically your drag force is dominated by friction. And since friction is speed independent, you essentially are independent of the frequency and the force that it takes to move through the material. So we call this and here's a recent result, which is kind of interesting. Remember I showed you the speed as a function of A over lambda. You can then go in and ask as well the cost of transport. How much energy does it take to move a meter? How many joules to, or joules to move a centimeter of the material? And what we find is, that in fact, that there's a broad minimum uh, in the uh, cost of transport, the mechanical cost of transport, to move your body to the material, which we don't yet really understand. Very new, but there then could also be an energetic argument for why you want to favor this particular kinematic. This is the robot. This is the simulation, yeah. The simulation. So yeah. how do you measure the cost? In, in this, we just measure basically the force times, the, we integrate the, the torques and the forces times the distance traveled, and then divide by the distance traveled, yeah, which we can get directly from the motors. So you can measure the mechanical. Uh, mechanical energy used to move the Okay, uh, we can also look at the power. And here you see the power is linear in frequency, which uh, is as it should be since power is the force times the velocity. And since the force is independent of frequency and the fre velocity is increasing with uh, frequency, then the power essentially scales linearly in the operating range of the sandfish. Again, this is the model. Uh, and as we increase the frequency to frequencies where the animal we never observed to operate, it begins to deviate away from this. And we think that's where inertial effects are starting to become important. But this plot allows us to ask a very important question at this stage. And is this simulation physiologically real, realistic in any sense? Because if we were to measure powers that are outside the bound of what an organism could supply with its, uh, with its motor muscle, then, then we're just acting crazy. And so we can look at this here. Uh, and here, for example, at about two and a half hertz, which is what we observe the animal operating, the maximum we observe the animal operating, we see that the power is close to about a watt. Uh, and so you can measure you know, watts per kilogram. And then you can go and look up in the literature. And I just did a quick survey. I had in my head that vertebrate muscle is capable of about 100 watts per kilogram. And uh, oops, you can find uh, some estimates, for example, 54 watts per kilogram in the desert and water, and Wainwright uh, measured in the taxial musculature of uh, bass, human bass, and measured about 300 watts per kilogram. So our 60 watts per kilogram is a reasonable number for what actual uh, muscle could generate, we think. So the simulation is not completely crazy, at least from the internal point of view as well. And finally, on the kind of mechanic side of things, we can look at the power generation and dissipation on the body. And this is kind of an interesting plot, which is new, and, and, and I just wanted to show it to you. What we have here is we basically binned up this simulation along the length into little bins, each about uh, 
1.6 centimeters long. Um, I'm sorry, 8.8 .8 centimeters long. And so you can see there's about 12 of them. And we measure the power calculated from the motors, basically the torque times the angular uh, frequency, power delivered by the motor to that segment. And you can see that, like we expect from the torque, uh, plot that I showed you earlier, it basically peaks in the middle. So the middle motors are generating the most power uh, to move this thing uh, to the material. The black happens to be for a lower amplitude of undulation, which we won't talk about now. The interesting thing, though, uh, is that you can then measure the power dissipated to the fluid by measuring the force on a segment times the velocity that that segment is moving the material. Uh, and you can see that, in fact, it's not peaked at all in the middle. Broad, but here, really, it's the head which is generating a lot of power, delivering the power to the material. And it's basically a kind of flat distribution in the, in the body. So I don't know what else to say about that, but I just thought it's kind of an interesting plot. Let's see. If anyone has any thoughts on that. I'm sure that people do this in fluids as well. Uh, I just don't know that literature is done. OK? OK, so that's then. Basically, a description of some of the mechanics we've been looking at in this. And now here's a kind of, uh, this is unpublished work. Much of what I just told you was unpublished. But this is unpublished, and uh, but I just felt that it's actually working well enough that I should show you. And I think it's kind of cool. Because here is our sandfish simulation. And again, we have you know, 50 motors that generate force to move this thing forward. And here's, of course, the organism. Uh, and this is it's motor driven and it's muscle, and I guess. I will assume that both of these are motors. This morning. Uh, but these are much more complicated, obviously, and the control is much more complicated. And so can we use anything that we learn about the motors driving the segments of the simulation to say anything to inform us about how the animal is actually internally actuating its structures, which I'll tell you about in a second. Because it moves to the and so here's just sort of a quick overview. It turns out that this is the trunk musculature in a lizard. It's not a sandfish lizard. Uh, and it turns out that something called the ataxial musculature is what is implicated in these kind of movements of the uh, body, the undulation of the body back and forth. And these muscles basically form long sheets which attach to the vertebrae and are able to be stimulated by the nervous system to turn on, to contract. And that contraction on either side of the spine is what ultimately generates the bending of the body. And that's the thing that ultimately moves the organism forward. Oh, I won't show you that. <laughs> well, so this, I should do that, but just, you know. This is an animal that died. This is what the actual muscle looks like. I figured that you ought to see it at least once, but that's uh, it, We didn't kill that animal. Um, but that's what the actual muscle looks like. And so what we do, and this is techniques that my students are assignments, uh, I'd say, put together a bioengineering student. And basically, you can go in and you can implant little electrodes in the apaxial, the back musculature, of these animals, with making the assumption that these are the things that kind of dominate the, the forcing of the organism. Um, and these are kind of some of the names of uh, bits of the apaxial musculature. Um, and essentially what happens, of course, as you know, is that in a contraction of the muscle, there's an action potential which stimulates the muscle to contract. Uh, and that's an electrical signal, essentially. And so by measuring the electrical activity uh, in the muscle, we can get some estimate, at least if the muscle is turning off. We can't necessarily, at this point, correlate the force of the muscle with, uh, with the signal that we measure. But we can at least get an idea if the nervous system is saying to the muscle, contract. So that's what we're going to do. And so what she does, these are very hard experiments, um, but none of the animals are harmed really in this experiment. I should say that they all have the same animals we've been studying for years and years now. And we implant a very, very fine 50 micron diameter stainless steel uh, wire into the muscle, the muscle uh, underneath the skin, so continuously. Uh, and then we can amplify these very small signals from the small electrical signals, and uh, we can then get an idea of going on. And so we choose four sites of implantation on one side of the back of the animal, and off we go. 30%, 50%, 70%, 90% as determined by the distance from the snout to the vent. Okay? And here's what we observe. Again, this is unpublished and very new, but you see here a video of the animal, and I'll let this play a few times, as it 
enters the material, and the four bar, the four plots here are the EMG, this is called electromyography, the electrical activity, the voltage developed in those wires uh, as a function of time uh, for the four different sites that we implanted on the body. And what she's done here also is she has uh, told the computer to plot a, uh, a dot, which you'll see in a second, whenever this electrical activity exceeds a certain threshold. So is that clear? So it's a lot to look at and to kind of keep us all playing over and over and over. Uh, but what you see is something kind of cool. The EMG signal uh, is basically flat up until when the animal begins to bury. So when the animal's walking on the ground, we, this was actually a very important test for us because we were worried that these are small voltages we measure and amplifying thousands of times. We were worried that the wiggling of the wires could be interpreted as signal, but as the animal the animal's walking here, and you see a very little uh, kind of, uh, voltage developed. Uh, as the animal enters in the material and begins to undulate, you see first this purple curve uh, rise in intensity, and the green, and the blue, and the black, which indicates that there's a wave of muscular activity propagating down the back of the body in accord with the kinematic wave that, of course, we're observing from our video. So this will play again, and you see, sorry, here's burst one. Verse two, verse three, and then we even get to the last burst as the animal kind of. And we're only seeing a burst uh, when the animal is contracting in one direction because we only have the electrode implanted on one side of the body. Okay, just to convince you that in fact, when the animal's above surface, it turns out that these sandfish lizards don't walk like many of the lizards we study, they tend not to have much back undulation when they walk, they keep a sort of straight back. And we see, in fact, uh, that kinematically, we also observe that the muscle activity, uh, the electrical activity of the muscle is very small and not different from this control of the wires just sitting uh, with no, with no movement at all. Uh, but clearly, beneath the ground, there is an increase in the mean intensity of the electrical activity. And in fact, this intensity is what people in this field find is basically uh, the EMG burst area, meaning I integrate the area, I rectify this signal and integrate the area under it, divided by the duration of the burst. Okay, so that's what we measure. And then it turns out that one of the nice things we see is that, like predicted from our simulation, the intensity is basically independent of the velocity at which the animal moves a segment of its body. So you can essentially track a point here, and you can track it uh, as the animal moves at different frequencies that it picks, and we find the intensity that it's uh, activating its muscle is uncorrelated with the velocity. Now the intensity doesn't directly tell you the force, it turns out for complicated reasons, but it gives a good estimate of that in fact the muscle is being used or not. Uh, another thing that she's done, she and Young have done, is they had the idea that said, well, we know that the simulation predicts that as the animal dives deeper, there's an animation, like deeper into the material, in fact, we can actually do this simulation, I don't, just don't have it uh, with me, that uh, the pressure from the surrounding material increases, as I told you before, monotonically with increasing depth. So as the animal goes deeper, unlike diving in a fluid, I should say, uh, it should have to activate more strongly. And so in the simulation, you can then measure the torques from the motors that are causing this activation, and you can see that they oscillate, as they should, uh, but the amplitude of oscillation uh, increases as the simulation dives deeper into the material. And so we wanted to see if we could see that in the organism experiment. And lo and behold, this is over five animals, and this is this uh, intensity that I described. Here, for example, you can look at any one animal, just to concentrate on one of the colors here, that indeed, as the animal dives into the material, the electrical activity in the muscle increases, which is in accord with the uh, hypothesis that the force produced by the muscle increases as it dives deeper which may not be a surprise, but it's a nice thing to see in the simulation. And so at some point, you expect that the animal dies deep enough so they just can't activate you more strongly than it may be done. Yeah? How do you make them uh, uh, deep as, as uh, I mean, dive as deep as you want? We don't. We just <laughs> let them do what they do, and then we just wait for a good run. Okay. But they always dive in at about 20 degrees, and so if, as long as they do a couple undulations, here we should got about you know, four undulations about here. Five undulations, and each undulation gets progressively deeper into the material. So, 
Just wait. Thanks, guys. Uh, the last thing I want to tell you about this is something which is a little bit hard to, I think, well, not hard to understand, but the diagrams I'll show you, I think, are a little bit confusing, but we'll just sort of go with it. Is, in fact, the activation timing of the wave. Um, because you might ask the question, when does the animal or the simulation decide to turn on the motors? Well, in the simulation, it, basically the motors are just being commanded to execute a certain position. And given external loads, the motors in the simulation will supply, supply the torques needed to ensure that that position is met at that time. And so we don't control the timing of that actuation. So I can show you the simulation in a second. But you can go in also and look at these sandfish videos. Uh, and you can see that basically the animals come kind of in, and here it starts to undulate, and now it's going to go in, and you get a purple, green, blue, black, and you can basically measure the curvature of the animal's body at 50% down the body, and you can plot when that animal's that configuration, when did the uh, electrical activity begin relative to that timing, and you can see that first the purple turns on, then the green, then the blue, and then the black. The corridor of the picture that goes away of activity traveling down the back. And you can do this in the simulation too. And I hope I can explain this. Uh, let's see what we have. We have the simulation. Here's the head and here's the tail. And here are the sort of corresponding markers in the simulation that we didn't plant on the organism. And here, what Sarah has done is measure the angle of, for example, this segment here uh, as a function of the percent of the cycle. And so what you see for example, the green one, is that at some percent of the cycle, the angle increases and then decreases to a negative as the animal undulates uh, positive to negative. And she can plot relative to that, relative in the cycle, the time uh, duration for which the torque in the motor is positive. Because that's, the, for example, the torque that's going to be moving the organism to shift it back to the other uh, angular orientation. And what you see is that the purple turns on first, it's close to the head, followed by the blue, followed by the green, followed by the yellow. Uh, and then you can do something, which is good, but then you can do something which is a little confusing. You can sort of shift these, like this, so that you end up with diagrams that look like that. And so this is sort of the, the timing relative to kind of a standardized uh, uh, angle change of the organism. But the bottom line is that, this is what it looks like in the simulation, the bottom line is that these motors turn on uh, in experiment, in electrical activity in experiment, turns on relative to the uh, changing angle of the body uh, in, a certain, in a certain pattern. And we see that certain pattern in the simulation as well. And the cool thing is that if we take the sandfish simulation and remove the granular material in the simulation. So have no, you know, just let it wiggle in the air and ask them what the torque is on the motors to make it wiggle in the air. It looks completely different. So here we have a organism uh, which is activating its back muscles in a way that seems to be well predicted by a simple simulation which, which has no, uh, no elasticity in the body. Uh, it simply just drives this kinematic pattern. And I think Lisa could probably comment better than I, because she's done this in the lamp break. So my question is, so what yeah. you're measuring is that there is indeed a phase lag between the, activate, the EMG wave and the actual mechanical wave. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, that, that is a factor of two. So the, mm -hmm. another way of saying that is the wave speed. Uh, I put this slide in for Lisa because I knew she'd okay. be able to tell, tell but, me how it goes. The wave speed is about double the mechanical wave speed, the EMG wave speed in this. And in the simulation, sorry, in the experiment, we see it's about 1.5. Because in, in Lamprey, it's about 80%. 80%. Or 101, I guess, 80%. The wave, the mechanical waves, there's a the mechanical wave speed is that 80% of the electrical wave speed. There's yeah. a lot of Oops. Yeah, so that's it. So that's what we, yeah. we see about 1.5. So 1 over 1.5 is about 60%. Yeah. yeah, so it's about the same. About the same. Okay. Sorry if that was totally confusing because <laughs> it's but it's new, but I wanted to get Lisa's uh, thing. But I just think it's a, a very nice kind of picture because, you know, we make these models and they're just, they're obviously not the organism. They're, they're simple, but to actually see it sort of predicting internal mechanics is kind of nice. Uh, 
obvious. Okay, so I think that's all I want to say at this point on the, uh, the, 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 the sandfish biology. Stay tuned, we're working on the paper right now, kind of put all this stuff together. Um, but now in the, in the closing part of the talk, I want to kind of bring it back to some more of the physics of uh, what we think is going on in, in, in swimming in sand, and that's develop a kind of theory of sand swimming. Again, we're experimental, so I should really have a theory of quotes here. But you'll bear with me and you'll correct any things that we get wrong. Uh, okay, so again, we have this picture that the organism is in fact with its head breaking up material. The material flows back along the body, and the organism pushes against that flowing material, pushing against a sort of localized fluid to propel itself through the granular material. Uh, it's not, for example, creating a tube of solid material and then pushing against the sidewalls that tube, that would be sort of the uh, kind of, in fact, that's I think how uh, C. elegans swims on the surface of an agar plate. It basically cuts a little groove and the surface clears off. This is, we think, a more kind of hydrodynamic like approach. Yeah. Can you repeat that? I didn't understand what you just said. What do they do? C. elegans, when they're swimming on a uh, surface, a solid, solid surface, again, in quotes, they basically cut a little groove into the material, the agar surface. And in that groove, once you're in the groove, you can basically just use friction from the sidewalls to normal forces. You can see the groove left behind the next uh -huh. It's like a disco plastic yeah. material. That was, in fact, our first hypothesis about what the animal was doing inside this material. That it was creating a kind of solid, like, chamber that it just sort of pushed against. But what we found is that it's not really that at all. No, we hide in the ground there. You think so, but we just, oh, okay. I will tell you something that I just discovered. We just. Me and my group just came back from Mojave where we were collecting uh, Mojave shovel nose snakes, which is a cute little snake about this big and this thin. And we just took x-ray videos of it. And in fact, it manages to go into the sand wave efficiency one, which sort of blows my mind. Meaning that it basically travels in two. Meaning that it probably is figuring out a trick to make sure that any local stress is always less than the yield stress material. But that's off the record. But, so the sandfish may just have a particular kind of mode. You know, one of the goals of my group is to go out and catalog everything we can find that swims in sand and see what it does. Because I think there's interesting biology, but there's also going to be interesting granular materials. Okay, but our goal here is to gain analytic understanding, I'd say, using tools developed for small organisms from the fluid. That's called resistive force theory. One way it's called resistive force theory. And we're not going to do it on the complicated simulated shape that I showed you uh, with the complicated taper. We're going to do a very physics-y sort of thing or maybe even a more physics and sort of thing, we're going to simplify the sandfish to a square to uh, not a long slender sheet because it's not a long slender thing. Uh, it turns out that you can do these simulations, which I'll show you uh, plenty, and it turns out that the, remember I told you yesterday that streamlining and granular material doesn't, doesn't give you a whole lot in terms of drag reduction. It doesn't give you the kind of factors of the drag reduction that one gets in aerodynamics. Uh, it turns out that by non-streamlining the head, you get a difference in drag about 20%, and that is in accord with the wave efficiency that you measure for this blunt-headed sandfish simulation relative to the tapered head sandfish simulation, and that's about 0.45 to 0.5. So we're not terribly far off in terms of where the animal is actually operating. All right, so here it is. That's a rendering. And again, we followed uh, basically Dre and Hancock through this. Um, and we are assuming a square cross-section swimming at a constant speed at a fixed depth for the waveform that looks like this. Now this is a complicated diagram. I'm sure it's actually quite familiar to most of you, but I'll just sort of go through it. We assume, of course, that the animal, uh, we measure the animal swimming like this, such that the y position of any segment oscillates sinusoidally with a wavelength and a wave velocity, which is the lambda times f. Uh, from this, you can derive all sorts of uh, things like you can measure. But let me just sort of define what's going on here. Uh, I examine each little element of the organism. I partition it up into little elements. Each of those has a little like S. Uh, each of those elements moves through the material as a function of time uh, with a given velocity v set by, this out, set by the v sub y, which is this which is set by the wave, and set by a v sub x, which is the forward swimming speed, which is ultimately set by the propulsive forces which push the thing forward. So each element is moving with velocity v. 
in the material, and not necessarily moving. There's a, let's say, piece of X, a piece of Y, and not necessarily moving uh, in the direction of the axis of the element. The axis of each element is inclined at an angle theta relative to the direction of movement, and you can find that angle theta by just computing dy dx, uh, and off you go. Now, the interesting bit here is that, like in fluids, let's assume the fluids, as you move through the material, actually I should have said another thing, as you move through the material, you generate a resistive force, F, on this little element, and that doesn't have to be collinear with the direction of movement. It turns out that you can think about, let's see what happens here, you can think about decomposing the velocity into a velocity perpendicular and a velocity parallel to the direction of motion, and there are going to be resistive forces, which you know very well in Stokes flow, uh, change uh, depending on the perpendicular and parallel component. So we're going to assume the same thing here. We're going to assume that we can decompose this force into a perpendicular. Assume we're going to decompose this force into a perpendicular and parallel component, and that it doesn't necessarily have to be collinear with the velocity. So that's what we have. Uh, and then you can basically figure out the net force on this element. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, you can figure out the net force on the element, which is basically the perpendicular uh, force times the sine component minus the parallel force times the cosine of it, which gives you the components in the uh, forward direction, the V sub x direction. I apologize, this is a confusing diagram. And the bottom line is that for thrust to uh, overcome drag, this is sort of thrust term, this is sort of drag term, you need this thing to be greater or equal to zero. So that's what you do. And so then what do you do? You integrate this little df, delta f, over the length of the body, uh, and you also add a term which accounts for the drag on the head as it moves through the material. And here's this bit here, and this is basically accounting for the arc length of the body. And you set, this thing, you set this thing equal to zero because we're assuming that inertia is not important here and the animal is going to swim at a constant speed, which is an assumption. Uh, you then cook up some expression for the head drag, which we're going to assume is a flat plate because we've made our uh, simulation of the flat head. And, uh, and if we want to use a simulated taper head, we can use a 30% flat plate. We'll come back to that. You insert the force laws, which govern how force is generated as this element uh, moves through the material at an angle uh, relative to the axis of the, uh, of the element. Uh, and you plug in to this expression, you solve then, it turns out you can solve for the speed divided by the wave speed for a given A lambda containing wave efficiency. And that's the program. And then the big question is, in uh, granular material, what are these functions? In fluids, for long, narrow elements, uh, these are basically governed by Stokes' law, uh, which the force is linear in the velocity. And if you want to know their force as a function of orientation of this element, uh, the velocity of this element, then it turns out to be simply the sine and cosine components of those with a ratio of these uh, coefficients in front of about 2 to 1. Yeah? But the, the, there are pieces in front and behind the element you're looking at. Yes, there are. also exerting forces as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, and so that's, that, that's the other assumption that I was going to say, is that the, the other huge assumption in all this is that all of these are independent. So the force that I, that this little element exerts, uh, the force that the fluid exerts on this little element is independent of the flow field that this little element obviously sets up and exerts on this element and so on and so forth. So you're assuming all of these are independent. In more sophisticated resistive force theories, which we don't do, uh, one, uh, I imagine, has coupling of these elements. I mean, they're not really independent because you're going to assume that you have an inextensible object. So part of the forces that you're actually generating are going to balance against. Yeah. Other things. They're yeah. going to be the constraint forces that make sure that that's also right. Right. But the actual function that I uh, use to uh, yeah. compute the force only depends on the local orientation of this element as it moves through the fluid. It doesn't depend on the what this element 
In other words, this element could have screwed up the material in front so that the force wall that I might measure uh, as I drag an object through this element of the fluid is changed. And we're just going to assume it's not. And that's a big assumption. It sounds sort of crazy. But this is what I assume I think was done in the early days of uh, transition. Yeah, I mean, I guess Peter never saw resistive force theory, so that's the, that's the approximation. But for lots of cases, for small amplitude, it's pretty good. Yeah, and I'm going to show you that in fact for large amplitude, better would be it. Okay, so, but it, these are known in the, uh, in the fluid world, at least for low Reynolds number swimmers, and we didn't know them for grand material because, again, we don't have a fundamental theory of grand material. We don't have a Stokes law for grand material. So, what we did is in our science paper in 2009, we actually dragged rods and experiment and measured the force on rods, but that's kind of inconvenient because when you drag a real rod, you not only have to worry about the forces on the sidewalls of the rod, you have to worry about the force on the end caps end caps on the rod and you have to subtract those off. So since we have this now nice validated uh, simulation, we can essentially use the simulation to just go in and directly measure the forces on the sidewalls of any element that we drag through. In this case, it's a little square rod. And then divide by the area and then essentially get the stresses. And that's what we did. And so here we have a uh, little rod element that we drag in simulation. And again, we're changing this angle of the heading of the uh, element relative to the axis of the element. And for uh, zero, you can see that, for example, we can measure the blue is going to be the perpendicular forces, and, uh, and the green is the parallel forces, forces in this direction. Or no, sorry, forget the, forget the end caps for a second. Yeah, the green is going to be the end caps. I'll take that back. Um, and you can see that on this rod, there are almost imperceptible, but non-zero forces uh, along the sidewall, they're very small, and they are the result of basically the fact that they're, even though the rod is moving in this direction through the material, there's surrounding pressure and there's friction between the rod and, those, and the grains, and so there's going to be a little bit of force pushing in. Uh, as you start to incline the rod, the little element uh, with respect to the orientation direction, you pick up the significant blue here, which is the force on the sidewall, which we will ultimately decompose as a perpendicular parallel. And as you orient it at 90 degrees, you see that it's all on this front sidewall. And you can go then go in and basically average this force and decompose it into F perpendicular and F parallel as a function of the angle. And here's what you get. Uh, and here's the perpendicular, here's the parallel as a function of this angle. And I've drawn in gray here the corresponding low Reynolds number uh, Stokes uh, force with a ratio of 2 to 1 just for comparison. And here is the experimental data and the points and the, and the kind of curve here is a fit, which we just cooked up a little spherical uh, force law. So we can put it in here, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, basically, it does an okay job of capturing it. But I just want to point out, we don't understand the shape of these curves actually yet. That's one of the current projects of uh, mine to work on, to try to understand the physics that goes into making this. But we can clearly say uh, that, that, for example, it's ultimately, as you can imagine, the perpendicular forces relative to the parallel forces, which generate the thrust relative to the drag. And in the Stokes fluid, you see that there is a perpendicular to parallel force, which is always about 2 to 1. Essentially, the magnitudes are 2 to 1. Whereas in the granular case, uh, this perpendicular force is enhanced relative to the, uh, to the parallel force. And so that somehow, when you push in these granular materials against the surrounding medium, the amount of thrust you're getting relative to the amount of drag is larger than you would do in a little bit. We don't understand that yet. We have a speculation that's related to kind of a pile of material at the surface of the rod to, to be continued. Um, you can also see that, that while the parallel, just as a plain old cosine, doesn't do a terrible job, uh, you can see that as compared to the uh, fluid case, which basically is a cosine, so it just keeps increasing down to zero, the uh, granular case actually peaks at about between 30 and 60 degrees, which is kind of interesting, and I think I, I can sort of explain that to some extent. As I'm orienting the rod, as I'm orienting, in this direction, the rod is down here, oriented in the, it's going right here. I have, I'm looking down on it now, I have material surrounding the rod and exerting pressure on it, 
and that pressure times mu is a parallel force, and that then should just be the basically frictional force that the material is flowing by the rod. And over here, I'm in a configuration such that I'm here, and I've now summed the force, and so I have material flowing in this way, some going off this way, some going off this way, and it balances to zero, and so you have no parallel force in that here. There should be a, a peak. That's sort of the most hand waving I can do at this point. Uh, but then, uh, those are the force laws. And so now, with those force laws, we're in the position to be able to plug them into our integral. Oh, wait, before I show you that, we can plug them into our integral and we can solve for whatever we want to solve for. But let me just show you, so I can turn this off over here. Yeah. Let me just show you how well they do. Just the uh, right most. Yeah. All right. Got it. How well they do. I think I'll stand over here for the last part. Uh, well, that's screw up the camera. Uh, how well they do compared to what we measure. So then there's a lot to look at in this movie as well, but I think it, it's kind of. It was kind of nice for us to see. Uh, so what you got here is black is the measured forces from the DEM simulation as particles collide into the body and exert force on the body, um, and, and these are resistive forces. And the green is if you assume that each element is moving with a given velocity, at a given angle, orientation, you can basically just look up in this force law and just plot that on there. And that's what you get. And so where you see changes in magnitude is that's because the segments are moving in an orientation uh, which changes the body. I should also say that we've done this over a range of speeds and they're independent speed. So that's the other kind of feature which is different than a uh, movement in a Stokes fluid uh, is that we have no speed dependence in this resistive force calculation. But your, your, your difference in forces will result in different Velocity. Yeah. So you're not showing two creatures on there. No, I'm showing one. I'm showing one creature, one simulation. I'm showing the simulation. So, in other words, in the simulation, I know the local velocity. I can measure the local velocity of each element, and I can just go back and go read into the force law what that is because I know its velocity. I know its heading direction, right? And I'm so, in other words, I just basically measure this each instant time and then just plug in the force that I need. And that's what we see. And so you can see on the head, now it turns out the head, we just basically use the DEM, a kind of flat plate, just plow through the material. And this looks like it's curved here, but that's just a rendering issue in that lab. This is actually a flat on the head. So okay, it doesn't look terrible, right? Uh, well, then you can do this business, you can plug these in, and it turns out that, you can for now take my word for it, numerically, you can essentially solve for the ratio of the forward speed to the wave speed, and that will be set by the um, these parameters A, lambda, uh, and uh, of course my force laws. And here's what you get after all that business. Um, and depending on your point of view, it's good or bad. We think it's good, but discuss. Here's the wave efficiency, uh, just to you know, pay attention to the loosely pack. And you can see the resistive force theory predicts that the speed should go linearly in, in frequency, uh, and it predicts a wave efficiency, which is in fact uh, maybe 20 or 30 percent higher than what we measure in the EM simulation. Uh, okay, but we think that the kind of functional form of the force gives some indication of why, for example, that the sandfish, when it moves in this non-inertial uh, granular material, has a uh, correspondingly larger wave efficiency than the nematode. And we, and we speculate that it's a result of the enhancement of the perpendicular forces and the granular thrust uh, compared to the parallel forces. And again, we don't understand the physics of that, but I suspect it's an interesting question to work that we that now. All right. So, yeah, I mean, if you just take the res resistive force theory of the Stokes type and you start pumping just the resistance to the normal part, you'll go to the wave efficiency of one. Right, right. Right. And so that's, that, that, it turns out is, you know, this function is not, if you scale this function up, this is not just a pure sign, of course, so it's not just up in the C perpendicular. There's something more. Yeah, right saying, but if you did. If you did, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. In fact, analytically, if all this was were sines and cosines, then we could, you know, do something. So I'll show you the next, the next little bit, because I'll show you how we are sort of getting an understanding of this. 
Okay, the, the nice thing is that, so, you know, you might not think that this agreement is very good, and these two bars here, by the way, are for different head drags. This is for a streamlined head, this is for a flat head. The flat head has a slightly lower weight efficiency. You put that in. It doesn't look so good, but the power of this business is then you can start to vary parameters again. So here now is the plot. Now, this is a very complicated plot, so I will. So this is the weight efficiency plotted versus A over lambda, and I showed this actually a number of times yesterday. Um, but let me, there's lots of different curves on here, so let me just walk you through it. The dark blue is the, well, not, let's not pay attention to the dark blue for a second. The light blue is the uh, blunt headed sandfish simulation, the DEM, that's the light blue uh, symbols. The, Orange curve here is the resistive force theory for the untapered body, this kind of tubular shape, uh, as a function of A over lambda. And you can see that, in fact, it does the same thing that the wave efficiency does in simulation. It increases very slowly, then increases more rapidly, and it basically plateaus, this curve here. And it turns out that the functional form is not terrible. If we simply scale, and I'll come back to this, if we simply scale the thrust forces in the force law by about 50%, we can make this orange curve lie basically on this light blue curve. So the resistive force theory is at least not completely crazy, and I think that gives some indication that this assumption of uncoupled elements is not terrible. We sort of have, we don't really have a good idea of why it's systematically higher yet. We have some speculation. Okay. The other form, other features of this curve I'll talk about in a second, but this is the wave efficiency as a function of A over lambda, the dark blue, if you make a tapered shape. And you can see them like you might expect. For every amplitude, you are more kinematically efficient when you have less drag on your head. But you see the base of a plateau to the same. But do you have a good reason to multiply 50%? No. <laughs> We just did it, uh, and I have I have a not good reason, which I'll show you in the end. But we really need help, I think, on this to try to understand, you know, what, what, what what's going on. We're we're coming at it from a physics, it's a brand new physics perspective. So I think it's a good question. Uh, but we did, and, and it just sort of looks right. So. so again, remember though that why am I interested in this curve? The reason I'm interested in this curve, the wave efficiency is a function of A over lambda, is because it turns out we have an argument that if I want to understand this optimum in terms of body lengths per cycle, it's a competition between the wave efficiency increasing with A over lambda and the wavelength decreasing with A over lambda because you're inextensible. And so the multiplication of these two gives you basically this shape such that the speed increases is a maximum at an intermediate A over lambda about 0.2. The, again, Light blue is the DEM simulation, and the red curve here is the resistive force theory. Again, scale fudged by 50% in the thrust forces. And you see, functionally, it doesn't do a terrible job uh, in describing this. And then again, the blue, the light, the dark blue, is the tapered head. And that tapered head is, in fact, the optimum is shifted to the left. Okay. So let me just show you, because this gets at something of what you're asking. It turns out the resistive force approximation in our model is, I expected it to be opposite, but is terrible at low amplitude and pretty good at higher amplitude. And what's going on? And uh, maybe this is well known in fluids, I don't know, but it's kind of funny. So here, what I've done, what Young has done, is basically he's plotted, again, the green is the uh, resistive force uh, prediction, given that a segment is moving with a particular velocity given by the little blue arrow here. So you see this is force prediction. And the black is what's measured. And you can see that uh, in terms of magnitude, the peak magnitudes are about the same. You'll notice where the velocity turns around, it's terribly off. Meaning the green is much higher than the black here. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, in, the, in the larger amplitude case, in fact, it's not that bad overall. But here it's really bad. Uh, so the fact that it gives away efficiency, which is about like a certain year, in some sense. Um, okay, so what's going on? Well, we did a simple experiment. This is really hot off the press, just to kind of get an idea. And what we think is going on is because we're not examining the transient part of the drag. We're only looking at steady state. So what I mean by that is that I told you before that in order to get the resistive forces, we essentially drag an object through the material, and we measure uh, after some time and after some distance that's moved, the mean force, and that's the force we use in our resistive force law, which I guess is what you do in Stokes. Uh, you know, simple resistive force for Stokes anyway. Uh, Stokes schools anyway. 
Uh, but turns out that's not a great thing to do. Um, and this sort of demonstration shows it. Here's a simulation that we did where we take a rod and we oscillate it back and forth. We reverse it to about ten, uh, 4 centimeters and it's the same 10 centimeter long rod that we in fact used in our lift, uh, lift simulations that I talked about before. And we do a couple different protocols. Here's the x position of the rod as a function of time. And the blue is a relatively high frequency undulation back and forth. The red is a undulation of that same frequency. Uh, and the green is an undulation of the same amplitude as the blue, but on a longer time scale. So this allows us to kind of get at uh, how forces being chained, how forces building up as a function of time. Let me just say this. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can do this. So, what does it say? The resistive force theory would say that in this experiment, what should happen is the following: as soon as you start moving the rod in one direction, the force should just pop up or pop down in this case to minus two newtons, and should stay there while you're moving it. And then, when you reverse direction, the force should go up, and it should stay there. So basically, looking like a square wave. But the measure uh, is quite different. Uh, this is not plotting against time, now this is plotting against cycles, so we can normalize and put them all in the same plot. And what you see is that for the high amplitude case, let's just look at the blue one for a second, high amplitude case, it kind of gets there and then sort of has big fluctuations and then it gets there and builds up and big fluctuations, but it never quite gets to the, the long drag, long time drag, the steady state drag that we're assuming uh, in the resistive force theory. The green is done on a longer time scale, and it shows something kind of nice that the frequency is independent of this business, right? You get to the same force uh, once you get far enough along. Uh, you just, it's, you just get there slower. Is that clear to everybody? No. The red is, I think, the kind of the, the culprit here, really the culprit. Here we didn't go nearly as far. Uh, we went, you know, only like half a centimeter, I'd see. And here you can see that the force prediction from the resistive force is significantly higher than the force prediction from just a simple rod graph which you measure. And we think that at least has some explanation of why, especially with these turning around points when the, when the velocity, the local velocity switches, why these forces are uh, so far off. And it probably, I just haven't thought about it enough, it probably even gives some idea of why the I mean, what's happening in this business is that the resistive force theory for any amplitude is predicting wave efficiency, which is quite a bit higher than what we actually measure, which indicates that the resistive force theory is uh, picking out enhanced thrust forces relative to drag. And so somehow, I suspect that uh, this is the helper as well. So maybe it's not the resistive force theory that's off, it's the way that you're measuring coefficients. Well, is that what you're saying? Because you're measuring that. I'm right. measuring the force. Sorry, when I say the resistive force, I should, I say, I'm saying that we're using we're using as the resistive forces on elements dragging through the material. We're using steady state drag values when the steady state drag values are a terrible approximation, especially when you turn your element around, as you can see here. Right, they're bad, and we think that's because if you are only moving small amplitudes, you don't have you don't build up enough force. Don't pile up enough material in front of you, or whatever the mechanism is in the granular material, to generate the steady state force that one measures when one drags an object through the material. I'd be very interested to know, actually, in the fluid case, what's the analyzer? Well, you know, we were just commenting that there are no transients in Stokes. You know, so the, so the forces get developed instantaneously given, given the motion. Really? Yeah, yeah so, I guess so, right? Well, that's cool, right? Yeah, so it's a, you, know, you wouldn't have this difficulty. Yeah. You have this coelastic fluid, it's like pure stokes. It's, it's well, pure stokes, I'm only about pure stokes. Yeah, so if you were just coelastic, then you could have some history. Like, you know. So pure stokes, right. You know, it's, it's, it's all time reversible. No time, so you don't have. So you don't have hysteresis. And this is a hysteresis. Hmm. Cool. All right. Good. Glad I showed you that. Uh, I still don't understand why then the perpendicular force is enhanced, but I suspect it has something to do with that. Okay. Uh, let me show you then the final bit, and then we'll then I'll, then I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. Uh, the final bit is these funny gray lines that I have drawn on here, which don't look anything uh, like they're anywhere close to any 
maybe. But that turns out to be not bad. Uh, but what these are is, in the best of our ability, our, our experimentalist version of analytic approximations to, to using this theory in these kind of, what I'll call, three regions of uh, this way efficiency plot. Low amplitude region, intermediate amplitude region, and then high amplitude region. And you can see the characteristic features are such that low amplitude, it kind of looks like it's quadratic. Intermediate amplitude, there's just a force as well as these DEM, look kind of linear. And at high amplitude, it looks sort of flat. Just you know, more or less. Okay. How do we get these? Well, and the reason I'm telling you this is that they illustrate what we have to do in this business to try to understand what's going on. Um, well, what you have to do is basically solve analytically this, this, uh, this business, but it was hard, so we broke it up into different regions. And let me just show you that a kind of important feature for low amplitude undulation here, for these movies, low amplitude undulation, what you see, and this is a very important feature, is that the thing is basically oscillating up and down and hardly going anywhere in terms of its forward speed. That's what the low wave efficiency means. So you're basically just oscillating. You know, so your Vy is whatever it is. Your Vx is nearly zero. In contrast, when you're in an uh, intermediate amplitude or kind of the optimum swimming, you're undulating up and down, but you're also getting some forward velocities. And so you can see that in the, uh, in the, uh, in the direction of the velocity, which is the blue here, and the green, which is the direction. But just pay attention to the velocity. And so you can see that these are the measured uh, instantaneous velocities of these little segments. And you can see they're basically up and down the page. Whereas in the higher amplitude case, these are essentially nearly following the direction, the local direction orientation of each element. Okay? So what that says, it turns out, is that for small amplitude, you can then, uh, as I said before, calculate this angle psi with respect to. Uh, which is we're defining as the angle of the uh, element moving through the material relative to the axis of that element, which is theta, the axis of the element relative to the forward progress direction. And you can see that for small amplitude, like I just argued and just showed you, that that is basically up and down. So this is a large number. And as you go larger and larger, this basically becomes uh, this number your, your velocity is essentially in line with the axis of, the, of direction of travel of your element. Now, okay, I'm going to say if you plot kind of the average angle as a function of A over lambda, you see just what I told you. You can measure this, you can see that it basically goes almost like one over A over lambda. And what else do I want to say? Aha, uh -huh. the, right, this is the expression. So what you could do, now this is, sorry, this is, uh, complicated, but it gives you the flavor. What you can do is basically go into what we call three regions here that we just sort of saw as, as convenient things to do calculations on and approximate the force laws uh, with simple linear functions in each of these regions. So this is region one, the, and region one corresponds to the low amplitude region on this plot. Why? Because in region one over here, where basically the perpendicular force is independent of this angle, uh, and the parallel force is decreasing the increasing angle. In this region, uh, what we see is uh, what I say? that right, the perpendicular forces are basically constant, and the parallel forces are essentially decreasing with increasing uh, angle. Since you're in this low amplitude region, this angle is always about pi over 2. And so you're down in this region of the curve here. And it turns out that as you, if you plug these into the, uh, to the, to the uh, integral that I showed you from before, you end up with an expression of the wave efficiency down here, which is essentially uh, Gray and Hancock-like and goes like A over lambda squared. So down here, our little model said this is basically quadratic in the A over lambda. With two coefficients, those two coefficients give some indication of the forces. The C perpendicular, this is just in region one, C perpendicular is constant, C parallel is constant, and so the wave efficiency is essentially a constant times this, and that constant, in order for the thing to move at all, has to be greater than one. 
so that's the prediction. And we did not do head drag here, so we expect that the, since there's no part of the uh, integral, uh, there's no head drag in the integral, then this should be uh, uh, terrible over prediction. And it is, at least to capture sort of at least the functional form. In this region, we can approximate the force law as, and so what I'm trying to say physically is that it's really the interplay of these force laws with how uh, the angle of the element is changing as a function of time and the projected angle of the element relative to the movement direction, which governs the wave efficiency of that point. As you increase the angle of that element, you're going to be generating more thrust forces uh, in the direction of motion, in the x direction. In region two here, we have a perpendicular force which is uh, increasing with this angle. Here and the parallel force is basically a constant here. And it turns out when you put that together, uh, you essentially get a competition, and it leads to basically uh, your linear increase. An in expression that looks like this in this region here. And finally, in the low side region, you have an in decreasing perpendicular force and a decreasing parallel force. And those two inspire when you stick them in to generate basically a constant uh, in wave efficiency in this region down here where the angle is highly very small. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's sort of our uh, attempted at analytic understanding of this. Um, but again, this is ripe, I think, for uh, people to do some serious work on this. And so if you're interested, please write me an email, see me, whatever. Uh, okay, the final sort of thing I'll say. Well, this is the question that someone in the back asked earlier. Why is the wave efficiency independent of volume fraction? And here I've given the force laws now, not for the 3 millimeter particles, but for the 0.3 millimeter particles the animal really swims in. And here there are more frictional particles. You can really see that here's the perpendicular forces, here's the parallel forces, and the perpendicular forces, the thrust forces, are really a factor of you know, two, two and a half uh, greater than the closely packed than the loosely packed. So what's going on? Well, there's one thing which is kind of amusing. If you take these curves, for example, if I take this curve and multiply it by 1.8, and take this curve and multiply it by 1.8, they lie right on top of each other, which means that the ratio of the perpendicular and parallel forces when loosely and closely packed is the uh, same, which sort of says that as I go into more closely packed material, it's harder to push through the material, but I can also generate more force to push off the material, so there could be balance in that way. That's one sort of speculation. Uh, I'm not sure that's right for the following reason. Uh, and here's something we did recently, and we're now working on this in, in more detail. And you can ask the question, remember I told you two days ago that if I drag an object through a brand new material, if I drag long enough, uh, if I drag it for long enough, the volume fraction that is achieved near that material it basically comes to the same point as critical volume fraction self-organizes because if it's too loose, it compacts a little bit. If it's too tight, uh, it loosens up a little bit. And so you can go into the simulation and you can measure, uh, starting from two initial conditions. One, a, a, the color code here is the local volume fraction. There down in the box. And the lighter yellow it is, the closer, the looser it is. And the darker red it is, the tighter, more tightly packed it is. And you can let the simulation run for a few cycles. And what you see is that the wake left behind the swimmer is basically the same color in both cases. So the fluid is organized into the same fluid that the animal is swimming. So one answer could be that the, in fact, thrust and drag just have this beautiful scale. The other answer could be that, well, you incur some penalty of uh, moving your head against the material, but that's relatively small compared to the amount of thrust and drag force that you're generating by pushing off in a material which is self-organized to be the same material whether you're swimming in loose or close to back states. And we don't have an answer for it yet, but stay tuned on that as well. So what does the color mean? The color is the volume fraction. Mm -hmm. The color is the volume fraction. Sorry. So you're using the word so that it's fluid. No, right. The local, the local, sorry, the localized fluid that the animal is swimming in. There's not an interstitial fluid. Meaning that, so, you know, if you go back to this. Is this there's no fluid in there. No, but, sorry, let me just, this is what I'm talking about. This stuff, the stuff that's moving. I'm going to call that a. The loosened. 
I'm going to call that a granular frictional fluid. This stuff here. It's, it, I mean, it's, 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 it's a fluid in the sense that you stress it, it, it flows. Um, so what I'm saying here is that this fluidized region, let me say that, is that the fluidized region around the organism is basically self-organized to be the same no matter what, uh, what initial state you present the organism with. And it's just a feature of the materials. But we don't know. That's just a, a thought at this point. Yeah? Yes. Might be kind of hokey, but in the simulation, could you set up a lot, like have have the particles form a crystal or something? Um, and see if you can that? Yeah, no, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah that, that would be an extreme low volume fraction case. We can generate relatively low volume fraction states. We can go, and, and it turns out, what is low volume fraction? Mean? Low volume fraction means that that when you can set up. It turns out that you can increase the friction such that you can generate states that the values of the uh, Volume fraction or 57, 60 percent, which can change resistance forces by factors of two. So you can really, I think those are probably useful. But you could, you could go to that extreme as well. I don't know if it would hold. I suspect those really new states, no matter what happens, you make a little perturbation of the material and it settles and impacts. Were you asking about very high volume? Yes. Yeah. Oh, very fine. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking the other crystal. I was thinking the other crystal. Yeah. 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 You could make the perfectly crystallized. Now, in the, our simulation, we have a slightly, or we have a bi dispersed mixture so that it prevents that kind of crystallization. Right. Not that it would happen anyway. These things tend to crystallize. Uh, but, yeah, I, I worry that that's been a very difficult problem. That's basically a you know, real fracture. Right, but I guess I'd be curious is if you force it to go through, yeah. would it still end up being, would the trail be? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. I don't know. It would take a lot more. Yeah, but the you know, simulation can, you know, we're not limited in power. Yeah? So similarly, what if you had really soft particles in your simulation so you could really crank up the volume fraction to like, I don't know, 70 or 80%? Yeah, I mean, it's a real squishy, uh, I don't know. I hadn't thought to do that, actually. Yeah, I worry that when you make them soft enough, the rheology is uh, different. I don't know. Yep. So, in, when you look at the ratio of the resistance coefficients, yeah. the perpendicular versus the normal has okay. to be greater than one. Greater than one. Greater than one. If it's less than one, then the, the swimming is in the same direction as the wave. That's right. And so there are creatures that swim in the same direction as the wave. Do you know about this? I've, I've so heard in the uh, in micro microorganisms, flagella that have these um, hairs attached to it, like mastigmines or histid flagella, yeah. they swim in the same direction as the wave. Mm. And larger animals like poly polychaete worms yeah. Yeah. have these hairy things. Yeah. See, they swim in the same direction. Mm. So the, mm. and, and, and the great brain Hancock, or those yeah. guys, they... Lisbon, I think, did something. That's right. That's right. So they said that's because it actually, the, the, that ratio changes to be greater than one. So it would be cool in your experiments to see what happens in granular material if, it, if you take your cylinder and put spikes around it and see if you get a switch. Yeah, we saw something like that in our snake models by messing around with yeah. the relative uh, anisotropies of the friction. So when you're digging around for animals, if you get spiky things and you're digging around for animals yeah, yeah. that move through sand, you can see that. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never don't know that. Most of the animals that swim, some are aseous animals, I think, tend to be smooth. Um, yeah. But I wonder what would happen if you just do the experiment with the rough surfaces and calculate your mm -hmm. coefficient. We can look at that. Is there another? Okay, so then. The final thing I think I will say, I think that's it, actually. <laughs> I think that's it. Okay, good. We're done. But, you know, 
but, oh, thank you for clapping, but I also, <laughs> I think that if I can make one sort of pitch is that we're operating, Peco is working on some of these problems, but we're operating right now relatively on our own. So if anyone is interested in working on some of what I find very interesting problems, for which I think we're developing the kind of tools that we can use to address these systematically, please join us, call me, contact me, we'd love to have you. So this, the robot you made, so you started, yeah. in the very first lecture you, you said how um, some of these applications are for robots in rubble and then Mars. Well, we're not making them for robots in rubble. I know, but not. it seems like these are, like, these swim, walk yeah. pretty well in yeah. sand, right? So they surely, do. I don't know, NASA should have surely. them, right? <laughs> yes, they should. Uh, <laughs> Well, I just came back from, yes, you would think they would be interested. Now, it turns out that here's a sort of interesting thing that if, and I've played with this, we had some ship to our lab, there's lunar regolith simulants, simulants. You know, people brought back stuff from the moon. Uh, and there's the simulants. And they are ridiculously hard to intrude into. They're kind of complicated powder type irregular things. And we subjected our sandfish to uh, some of this lunar regolith simulant that just said, no way. It just didn't get it. So, so was that the powder from the moon? Well, it's a simulant of the powder from the moon. Oh, right. Regular, it's called. It's a general term for kind of the soil on the moon. Uh, and I guess I'll... So your animal doesn't move it? It wouldn't go in. But that could be behavioral. I mean, it didn't yeah. smell right or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I will say that the resistance forces... Yeah, what you about know, your robot, though? Our robot is... <laughs> again, that's why I put it in quotes. We don't have a robot. We have a physical model. The real roboticists could do so. I mean, I think you probably need what people do actually for drills on these things, if these percussive shovels are probably great things to I think that, at least in kind of, you know, approximately monodispersed dry sand, this kind of swimming is, at least, you know, for what the sandfish does, pretty good. Um, but there's, by the way, lots and lots of organisms that not only dig in and use in dry materials, but dig in wet soils and complicated, nasty stuff. And they have all sorts of interesting head shapes and appendages and just some crazy creatures out there that sort of liver in the ground. And so I think that, yeah, NASA should be interested. Yeah, Peck talked companies. about clams. Yeah, the, 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 the robot clam, the razor clam is a great example. And that's using a kind of fluidization as well. <laughs> What about people swimming in granular stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, Swim, swimming in those little ping pong balls. Yeah, so I've wanted, to do this. I've, I've, I've wanted a friend of mine to do this with his kid. Uh, you know, you can go to wherever, Chuck E. Cheese or the ball pits, and I want somebody to take their small child uh, and put a mast on their kid and have them do it. Because I think it all works. <laughs> so if you have a small child, they're willing to. You know, <laughs> But there are grain silos, and in, in principle, yeah. peas, you know, yes. peas aren't so dense. That's right. And uh, so I go into one of those. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard. I mean, you know, the sandfish makes it look very easy, I think, but um, I guess we'll equip you with that sort of, you know, good thing under hand. Yeah. Robert De Niro does it in his latest movie, Luca Fokker. Yeah. He, he, he swims through a little cup of ball. Really? <laughs> And then he jumps out and beats up Ben Stiller. You should show that. I should show that. Good. All right, I'll find that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you study these systems? So I have a question. Um, it's slightly out of the velocity range that you talked about. Yeah. Are there any systems where um, the sound speed of the sound becomes important, mm -hmm. and you can get into you know, basically high drop numbers and then sort of chop it? Oh yeah, uh, there are indeed. Um, well, uh, I should say that, uh, are you talking about in the kind of locomotor sense? Well, I would guess that for locomotion it, it would be too slow because, I mean, just from what Paco told us, things typically travel like one body length per second or something like that. So, well, so I guess that, you know, seven seconds. Can you, can you humor me for 30 seconds? Let me show you here. So here is an example, we think. Now this I didn't, we have an entire program in my group to understand not just locomotion within, but locomotion on. And there you start to get, I think, more interesting effects in terms of the inertial force that you talk about. So here's a lizard. It smacks its foot. This lizard is running at, uh, at I think this was a meter and a half a second. It's like this long. And it smacks its foot into sand and all sorts of stuff. Here was a 
this was actually one of the graduate students. Here's an experiment we did in impact. Impact events tend to probe at low velocities. They're more kind of frictional. And at higher speeds, you don't have to go too high. Then you start to propagate beautiful shock waves, which we've done simulations to measure. So yeah, so those probably have some relevance to this animal, and even more relevance to this, one of my favorite animals, and then I will quit, but I just have to leave you with this, because I told you about subsurface swimming, but many animals just run on the surface. This is the Mojave. I'm not sure this is the Mojave. This, we can take this video, we go and collect these animals. It's called zebra tail lizard, and it lives in all this kind of nasty stuff, including flat deserts, washes, and can also go into sand dunes. And watch this video carefully. This is going. <laughs> it's a disappearing lizard. <laughs> so there's claims of there's claims of eight years a second in the literature. I don't think that's true. Four we've seen uh, eighty body lengths a second. And the cool thing about this animal is it has this is the phylogeny. This is kind of how the animals related to their, their, their relations. And if you look at its foot length, it's huge compared to its leg length. And there it is. And it's just sort of ridiculous. It looks like clown feet. But it uses these feet in a beautiful way. And we discovered that on hard ground, people have seen this before, but we think we have an implicated the mechanism. It uses this toe, which has a really a tendon coming all the way from the tip of the toe to the, to the, to the muscle back in the limb. Uh, and it uses basically as a spring to bounce over ground. But the case, which is more interesting and gets to your point, or not maybe more interesting, perspective is that this foot hits it basically a meter and a half a second and plows into the material and sweeps backwards through the material, generating a kind of fluidized state at a regime where now uh, inertial effects are important. And we're trying to understand this from that perspective as well. So yeah, so there, swimming may not be the right example for this, but certainly there's a lot of fast runners on these materials. So the foot in this one goes all the way around? Like uh, the, the, the foot in this one actually hits the ground in a plantigrade posture, flat to the ground, and then sort of sweeps through the material. A beautiful kind of, and we've used x-rays to kind of look at what's going on underneath the material. Um, and there are clearly, there are rate effects in these kind of things. Yeah? I think the most uh, important thing about this one is the tail is not touching the ground. In the other cases, this one, the tail is just floating. Yeah, in fact, the other cases, uh, the tail is touching the sound and actually is used as, you know, sort of a way to you know, for locomotion, it's very important. It's like the third point that you need, you know. Oh. This is what I think. Yeah, that think could be. Wrong. I think these things are probably even static and stable on, you know, two or two years. But I, I think the tail, actually people and start... And it has a shorter tail than the other. People start to look at actually the role of the tail in locomotion, and it can be this kind of inertial. And the huge other thing about this, though, is it's still only going about one body length per stride. Mm -hmm. So it's just really quick. Right. The frequency is really high. It's not like it's kind of gliding along. Right. On one Although that said, this does have aerial phases. So if you look at this, it's more effective. Well, not a whole lot more, but it, 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 it is going aerial. This is, this is, I think, a run of about a meter and a half a second. Uh, you know, multiply that by okay. three, and you're, you're going for a significant distance. And when these really go fast, they go on. So then it wouldn't just be a straight. Mm -hmm. That's right. Would be That's right. This kind of stuff. Do they have a gallop? These, I don't know. I don't, I don't think these animals can bend their backs in the way that, uh, you know, you know a mammal, for example, gallop. There's more of a side to side. I don't think they, you know, they go. They go fast, but they go by keenly. They go two limbs. And there, I think the tail actually becomes important. Yeah? You said you were collecting these animals? Yeah. So I should just say, yeah, so that a lot of our animals that we study, we uh, can obtain in pet trade. So for example, the sandfish, you can just buy, you know, you can buy your child a sandfish. And it's nice. uh, um, but some of the animals, we actually have to go and get ourselves, because you can't get them in pet trade, for example. This one should be hard to catch. They are hard to catch. You have to, you have to know how to do it. And I know we're out of time, but I can tell you after how to do it. Or I can tell everybody, use a long fishing pole with a little noose at the end of it, 14 foot fishing pole, and a little noose at the end of it, and for some reason, God knows why, lizards and snakes, if you dangle a very thin little noose over their head, they do not react at all. They get some fly or something, just to so they dangle over their head, and you go, pull up, and the noose grabs, and you grab it, and put it in the basket, and that's it. <laughs> so, join us in the field, also. <laughs>